King Charles III addresses the British Parliament for the first time as monarch. We begin today's show looking at the legacy of British colonialism in the Caribbean, where there are growing calls for reparations. The Caribbean at one point formed the heart of England's first colonial empire in North America. Many of the more than two and a half million enslaved Africans taken to the British Caribbean were worked to death. The string of island nations includes Jamaica, Barbados, the Bahamas, Antigua and Barbuda, and Trinidad and Tobago, among many others now in the British Commonwealth. Following the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the prime minister of the twin island nation Antigua and Barbuda said voters may soon decide whether to leave the Commonwealth and become a republic. Prime Minister Gaston Brown spoke to ITV News after he confirmed Charles III as king and head of state. This is not an act of hostility or any difference between Antigua and Barbuda and the monarchy, but it is uh, the final step, as I said before, to complete um, that circle of independence um, to ensure that we are truly a sovereign uh, nation. What sort of time frame would you think on a referendum then? So I'd say within the next um, probably three years. This comes after Barbados voted last year to break from its colonial past and become a republic. Meanwhile, in Jamaica, the ruling Labour Party says it also plans to hold a referendum on becoming a republic. For more, we're joined in Kingston, Jamaica, by the renowned Jamaican dub poet Muta Baruka, who's also a musician, radio show host as well. And in St. John's, Antigua, Dobreen Omar is with us, the chairperson of the Antigua and Barbuda Reparations Commission, also an ambassador at large of Antigua. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Dobreen Omar, let's begin with you. Uh, with the death of the Queen, first your response and then what you're calling for for your country. Well, um, it's good to be here. Let me say thanks for having me. Um, in terms of my response, I will be I, I will be very measured here. Uh, I will recognize that we are talking about death. We are talking about the loss of human life, and that the Queen would have had family, etc. But I'm under no obligation, I think, to 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 be mourning her death, um, and that is simply because of I, I think my understanding of history, my understanding of the relationship of the British monarchy to African people and Asian people, but to African people certainly on the continent and here in the Caribbean. Um, and so that my, my response is, is perhaps to, to recognize um, the role that the Queen, Queen Elizabeth um, II, has played, how she has managed to cloak um, the historical brutality of empire in this in 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 in, in this veneer of, of grandeur and and pomp and pageantry, I guess, and graciousness. But I think that at this point in time, we need to examine that history a lot more closely. And speaking of that history, could you, uh, for those people who are not aware, especially of the roles of King Charles I and King Charles II uh, uh, in the Caribbean, uh, and especially uh, towards your country, could you talk about that? Well, um, if we look at the role of, of, of a monarchy, um, so we are going back now, mid um, 17th century, 1600s. Um, King Charles I was, was perhaps the monarch, I think, that opened the trade um, between uh, Britain and, 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 and Africa. That was originally gold, um, minerals, etc., that opened that trade up to human trafficking, to the enslavement, to the, the movement of enslaved Africans. King Charles II, who followed him, actually was responsible, along with his then cousin, who later became James I, totally responsible for and uh, responsible and ownership of the Royal African Company that moved more Africans off of the continent into the Americas than any other company um, in, in, in history. So what we are talking about here is the involvement, the 
involvement of British monarchy in the ownership and the operation of the of the um, transatlantic, I prefer to call it, of the European slave trade, the movement of Africans here into the Caribbean. And so we now see this movement. Um, and even before um, Charles I, we, we, we can be addressing um, Elizabeth I. And we see this recurrence, of course, in, 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 in the names that, that we are talking about. And so we now supposedly should be mourning the death of Elizabeth II. Um, and welcoming a Charles III. But we know them. We know these Charleses and we know these Elizabeths. So, so there is there, there's virtually no mourning for me on, 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 uh, at, at this moment. I'd also like to bring in uh, Mutsu Baruka, the renowned Jamaican poet, musician. Uh, your response to the death of Queen Elizabeth and also of the British Empire's relationship to Jamaica. Good morning. Um, I am totally agree in, in agreement with the, the first speaker. And I don't even want to go back into slavery because a lot of people claim that Queen Elizabeth was not responsible for what her ancestors did. She herself said that slavery was legal at the time, so she don't really recognize what we in the Caribbean is talking about. Now, we have to realize in 1952, that was when she, she ascended the throne of England. And if you check the history between 1952 and now, you will see that even though slavery was abolished, but they, what we call it, redefine slavery and call it colonialism. And colonialism in this part of the world was represented by the throne of England. So we're not really talking now about an individual person. We're talking about a, a corporation, an institution, which is called the monarchy of England, that has totally devastated a lot of the progress we could have made if it wasn't for this what we call colonialism interpreted to us as slavery still. Now, we have to remember, in a her time, there was the Mama uprising, which is a very interesting case because she was actually named Queen of England when she was in, 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 in Kenya. And the, the cruel and wicked things that the British army did to the African people there cannot be seen as just Okay, that is just something. And she had never, never granted any sympathy or said anything that would say, well, you know, she have a kind of art to what was taking place. We look in South Africa during the apartheid system. The British is part of that wicked apartheid regime that devastated and killed thousands of Africans who was fighting for right to be a person in South Africa. And it was not, it was recently, even during the time of Mandela and with Mandela, that we was told that they were still on the list of terrorist groups. And even though England and this queen was ruling at that time, there was no effort to find out what is it they can do to help to alleviate the problems that confront African people in this part of the world? Now we come to the Caribbean in this time. The Caribbean has been devastated. We know in history, one of the richest plantation owners, cane owners, was a man by the name of William Beckford. William Beckford got his riches and became one of the richest men in England in, in that time. And up to this day, when we recognize how much people died because of the institutionalized slavery that they call colonialism, up to this day, the, the, the movement of our people, in the, especially in Jamaica now, where our constitution was given to us by England through the hands of 
the so-called um, Bustamante and Man and, and Norman Manley, who was recognized during that time in 1962 when Jamaica was supposed to be getting independent. They went to England and they got a constitution that is now part and parcel of what Jamaicans are supposed to live by. And when we look at that constitution, it does not include ownership of land in Jamaica by the people. If you go into the courts of Jamaica, it says the Crown versus Tom Stroke or the Crown versus John Tom. That is what we have to face right now. Now, when you recognize that Jamaica is supposed to be an independent city, it's country. Most Jamaicans say it's Jamaica no independent. That even though people say it's like a, it's, it's not rich, it's not really governing the country. But the head of state, the head of state is the governor general um, representing the Queen of England in an independent country. How the hell that can that is possible? That you have an independent country that is the, 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 the first lady is the governor general wife, not the not the, 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 the prime minister's wife. And they set and designed the constitution that way. And these so-called, we call them bosses slaves, jacket and tie slaves, that they continue to uphold and maintain that regime that has committed so much atrocities and crimes in this century, in this time. They have been commenting it and still commenting it. And we don't see why we should now sit down and say, 12 day of morning. That to show how backward and how what we call the Stockholm syndrome has grabbed our leaders in the Caribbean. That here's a here's a family that represent criminal activities of your ancestors. And now you start to love them. How, how is that possible? How is that possible that we who know the history is keep repeating the history? We know what is taking place. In, in this democratic, so-called democratic country, that is still honoring the most gruesome and cruel monarchy that ever exists, and we know of it. How can we now sit and say, we're going to have 12 days of mourning? 12 days of mourning for, for, for what? But we're mourning that far. Why we never, we're not mourning for the thousands and millions of people that died across the Atlantic Ocean. We're not mourning for all the, 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 the warriors of our time. There's no day for Taki. There's no day for Nani. All of these people who died because they stand up Mo and struggle to get out of the class of British colonialism. Mutabur we now sit and say, we must mourn. I am not one of them who's mourning, and I can talk for a lot of Rastafari, Virgin and Sistrin. Uh, we, we don't see it as a mourning time. Muta Baruka, I um, wanted to ask your response to Charles at the time, Prince Charles, just a few weeks ago, praising the contribution of Jamaicans to British life as immeasurable in a message commemorating Jamaica's 60 years of independence from the UK. Um, now you have Jamaica also talking, like Antigua and Barbuda, of a referendum um, on complete independence, on becoming a republic. Uh, what would what do you think the outcome of that will be? And what would reparations and an apology look like to you? be adequate right. for you. By All the right, way, first, it's an honor to speak with you again after so many years having years, talked to you in uh, Brooklyn. Years, years. Uh, all right. What he's saying is what we expect him to say. You know, actions speak louder than words. And if he is here now to do certain things, he must understand how we feel as African people in this part of the world and what his family and ancestors did. So to address the situation, it's not just to say why he feel bad about what is happening. That is not apologizing, because he did that already. He came to the Caribbean and said, why well, I feel bad about what, what was happening. We need somebody saying, look here, we see what happened, and we was responsible for it, 
and we're sorry, I'm going to make amends. And the amends come with what we call it, what them call um, getting something going between the, the governments of the different countries then, to facilitate reparations and repatriation. Because we're not taking that out for those who desire to go back to Africa. Because we came to Jamaica not by free will, but by force. Nobody asked to come to, to the Caribbean. None of these Africans, at least my sister, never asked to come here. So the Rastafari community is crying out, say, reparation, repatriation. Meaning that those who are desirous of going back to Africa must be able to do this without the argument about Commonwealth of Nations. And that is really a hindrance. There is no moving away from the queen and the monarchy if the countries that claim getting rid of the monarchy is one. But if you still in the Commonwealth of Nations, that still bind you and grip you to the same colonial system that you are trying to break free from. There is no getting rid of the queen or getting rid of the king and you're still into the Commonwealth. We as Jamaicans, there's a lot of grandfathers and who's living today who fought in the Royal Air Force during the World War II and who get, went to England to help build up England. And what we hear now, first of all, Jamaicans have to have a visa to go to the so-called motherland. Jamaicans is not allowed to stay there at a certain length of time. And now we have the Windrush people who just recently, we see that they're trying to send back people who was in England for 60 years and have children at them house and everything. They're sending them back to Jamaica. That is one of the most racist things that I have ever seen in my lifetime. Where you uh, go to uh, build a but, country. But, yes. but, uh, I'd like to bring in uh, on this issue of uh, reparations, Dobrino Marde also, to t if you could uh, tell us in the letter that your, your commission submitted to the royal family, what were some of the demands and how do you see reparations? Well, certainly. The letter that we wrote, well, it would have been our second letter addressed to British monarchs. Um, earlier, I think maybe about a year or two before, Prince Harry was here. Um, and certainly this year, this year or last year, I mean, I'm getting lost within this COVID mess. Um, the other brother was was also here, who is now, I, I, I guess, um, destined to be the next king of England. And our letter simply said to them that we were very tired um, and, and, and rather insulted by their approach of telling us things that we already knew that we knew that slavery was horrible. They didn't have to tell us that. That we knew who that genocide was committed. They didn't have to tell us that. And our, our letter simply said to them, well, well, please, do, do, do not come here and insult us further by saying things that um, the Tony Blairs have already said, that your Minister of Foreign Affairs had come and addressed the parliament in, in, in Jamaica and, 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 and looked at us. It's Caribbean people, as descendants of enslaved people, to tell us that we should forget it and just move on, that just let's forget this uh, move on. And that is essentially what we said um, in, in our letter. Now, in response to your <laughs> the other part of your question of what does this, um, what does reparations look like for us? What does this moment mean to us in the reparations struggle? I think certainly that we're asking Britain to reassess its role in the intentional on the development of Africa and, and, and this Caribbean. Asking Britain to reassess its role in the genocide, in the plunder, in the violence that it exerted um, on African people on the continent and here in the Caribbean. And that in reassessing this role, that it must understand clearly that the morality of the situation, the ethics of the situation calls for repair. And in that repair, we, we essentially are talking reparations, that you have committed crimes against humanity. 
and that there is a moral and an ethical demand that you acknowledge these crimes and you do your best in the best way you can to make whole this, the, the, the holes that you have, have, have really um, left in, in, in the history and in the lives of African people. I'm a member of the CARICOM Reparations Commission as chairperson of the Antigua and Barbuda Reparations Commission. And that commission has issued a 10-point plan that defines um, for the international community, defines for us here in the Caribbean how we see reparations. The plan that, that we have issued is a development plan. It's in contrast, let's say, to the legacy um, reparation plans that are being developed elsewhere in the diaspora where individuals are identified as the recipient of reparations. Um, the CARICOM reparations plan talks of development um, in the first instance, it identifies those areas in our development across this region where the hurt of enslavement and genocide continues to exist and continues to impact on the lives of Caribbean people today. And we are saying that in that development plan that we are inviting inviting yeah, is the word that I, I think we have to use at this point in time, um, Europe to sit at the table with us and to discuss this development plan addressing areas in education, in health care. Yeah. And as Muta Barak has just said, we include in that this whole question of repatriation of those persons who want to go back to the continent. Um, we, we're Dabrine, talking we have 15 yes. seconds. Yeah. We're talking um, psychological. We're talking debt. We're talking debt. Um, debt. 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 Debt relief. Um, a number of issues within that ten-point plan.